member of the Dummerston Conservation Commission. Thank you for coming out on a rainy night, but it's better than a snowy night, which we've had for the last few Tuesdays, past few months. Um, and I'm happy to introduce Claudio Valise. Thank you. Um, Claudio is a, has a dual um, occupation as an architect and as an astronomer. And many of you recognize him from the call classes at Keene State College. He's also um, a, the president of SOVRA, the Southern Vermont Astronomy Group. Um, so thank you for coming. I thought I might have to warn you about salamanders, but I think it's too cold. So you're all safe to drive home tonight. So enjoy. Good evening. Uh, nice group, especially given the, uh, the weather con conditions. This is, this is very, this is delightful. Just out of curiosity, how many either have been or are students of mine? <coughs> Ooh, okay, we've got a few. Um, thank you for coming, all of you. Tonight's going to be a bit of a, um, of a journey. It's, it's going to be a brief journey. Uh, it's got about three parts to it. Um, For many, many, many years during which astronomy research has been done in the past, um, it's been a steady growth in accumulated knowledge. It's been a rather mannered rate. And throughout history, the biggest variable, the biggest variable in discovery, hey, Phil, how are you? Um, the biggest variable in, in discovery hasn't been that a human being has suddenly, in a genius way, made a great discovery. Uh, that does happen on rare occasion. But the biggest variable is technology. Uh, the most obvious example is when Lippershe created telescopes that were basically toys. They were, they were amusements. And a fellow by the name of Galileo Galilei took one and said, oh, that's kind of interesting, and he went like that. And when he turned it up, of course, he changed history. And that's an example of how technology leveraged exposure to us of a whole world that we hadn't even thought of, or worlds in that case. Well, the same thing is happening now. As a matter of fact, more so even than the Renaissance, by far, we are suffering a multiple tsunami of increased data. Um, and that's where some of you may come in. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, so, uh, <coughs> what we're going to talk about are a couple of examples of what is a growing number. In fact, a few more were found about a week, week and a half ago. There's some things that we're seeing out in deep space or that we're, we have evidence for that we're having a difficult time explaining. Now let me, let me explain. Um, <laughs> that's the norm. Anytime we see a new thing, a new animal, a new beetle in the jungle, it's a new thing. And we're not going to know everything about it right away. It's incremental. And we have a tendency, and we all do this, let's admit it, we have a tendency when we, s when we encounter an unknown thing, especially in astronomy, what's the word? Aliens, right? <laughs> right away, right away, oh, it's gotta be aliens. It's gotta be aliens, it's the only way to explain it. Well, there's a lot of that going around. But the one interesting thing is that the hardcore researchers now, um, they're, they're doing their usual proper skeptical thing, but they're also being technical about it and they're saying, look, in a couple of these cases, we can't discount that as a possibility. But not being able to, dis to discount something as a possibility is not saying this is what it is. Because our emotions get in the way of our brains all the time. I don't have to tell any of you about that. If anyone's ever thought they've been falling in love, that's a good example. The, the brain's the first thing out the window, right? Well, the same thing happens in science with the general public. Can't explain something? Got to be aliens. aliens, right. Okay, so let's moosh along here. 
Um, can I kill the? What? Um, it was aliens. Um, is it's that a Lyra in the bottom right of the bottom right of the Milky Way there? That's very Lyra-esque, isn't it? it is. Yes. Right yes. It's no, it's just not fair, you know. What's the new administration? <laughs> it's the n right. <laughs> or the new administration, you never know. Can we, can we, oh, let me turn these off. Yeah. Going, going. <laughs> All right. You'll dark adapt in a bit. You'll be able to see pretty well. Okay. Um, yeah, what you're seeing here, this is, this is a, a, a vertical l image. Um, it was somewhere in the world where the Milky Way at that time of year was aligned just so. And what you're seeing is the, Milky w the axis of the Milky Way uh, up above. And I think that there's a little moonlight here because other or, or some artificial light that's illuminating down below. So that's, that's what that is. Um, all right. This is where a lot of the trouble started. Um, this, this mission took off, this is the Kepler uh, Space Telescope. It took off, as it indicates, in March 2009. And its job was to go up and and look in one part of the sky and not blink. <laughs> now, the, the Hubble Space Telescope was, was created to go up and look over here and, and take an image, and then when it was done there, it would turn over here, take another image, and then it would go over here and take another ad infinitum, and it's still doing it now for 25 years. Um, the, the Kepler Telescope had one mission, that was to look in one direction only. And they had a peculiar first time ever uh, employed orbit. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, as most of you probably know, orbits the Earth at a distance much higher than where the space station is, which makes it very difficult to get to, but, we, but it's still nearby and we can still get to it in a pinch. Um, in this case, what you're seeing here, let me illustrate. I keep thinking I've got a wire and have to, I'm going to walk over. But uh, sun is here, as it says, sun. That circle is our Earth's orbit, the black line. The green line is the orbit of Kepler. And the first blue dot, for those of you who can see it down here, it might be a little difficult, is where, it is where the Earth was and Kepler was, of course, when it launched. And after four years, it had drifted behind us like a caboose on a train being left, uh, left to go back. After four years, it was here. And by now, I think it's about here. So it's, it's falling behind us. Now, that's done very, of course, very purposely. But the reason for that is to get it away from Earth, from the glow of Earth, uh, from the glow of the moon when the sun is shining on it, which is all the time, unless it's in an eclipse. Um, <coughs> and by doing so, it's able to point at its target without being concerned about stray light nearby. And that was a very important aspect of it. Uh, this is what the thing looks like. It looks very telescopy. It's round, it's long, um, and it fits in a rocket, which you saw launch a little while ago. And to compare to other things, this is Kepler up here. This gives you a sense of scale. That's Apollo on the Skylab, and there's the Hubble in comparison. So it's not that big of a telescope, but it did its job really pretty well. Now, a little, a little background. Um, as a reminder, there are three different kinds of telescopes. A refractor, as the name implies, refracts or bends light through as it goes through glass. Um, if you take two pyramid pyramids, two uh, prisms, and some of you in school we use prisms, remember that? And you shine white light through it and it would spread out into all these beautiful colors. Well, if you take two prisms and put one on top of each other, so you have a triangle with a pointy part to the top and a triangle with a pointy part to the bottom, you have this kind of triangle-ish, double triangle thing. And if you shine white light through that, on the other side, all these colors come out, right? 
Well, if you smooth that out, so, those, so that angularity is curved, you have a convex lens, right? Does that make sense? Sort of a smoothed out double uh, prism. That's the problem for astronomers. For us in our living rooms, who are enjoying sunlight and pretty colors, this, that, that's terrific. But for astronomy, it's a problem. Because all of those colors, you don't, want those, you don't want the colors. You want the colors all to come to a point, as if they were all the white light coming to a point. So you may need a second piece of glass, like some of us are wearing glasses. Lenses sometimes need glasses. And that's why you, s you may see up here what are called separate elements. So there's the convex lens, and there's the second slightly concave lens, and that those would be called separate elements. Anyway, I'm getting too detailed here, but you get the idea. Light goes through there, it's correct, and, th and that, by the way, that second one it does the correction, and all that light comes back to a point back to about here, where my finger is just off the screen. Well, the problem is when you take a telescope then and point it up, how are you going to look through it? You've got to kind of, you know, <laughs> do that. And how long are you going to be able to look at something like that? And it's not going to be very long. It's uncomfortable. So you put in what's called a star diagonal. I am still trying to find somebody who knows why it's called a star diagonal and not just a diagonal, because what is it? It's diagonal, right? And it's flat, bounces the light, and takes that pinpoint where the focus would have been out this away. You put a little eyepiece in there, you look in, and see the moon or Jupiter or whatever you're looking at. Everybody happy. All right, so that's a refractor. And then you can imagine what the other kind is. It's a reflector. So instead of light going through glass, it bounces off a mirror. But this isn't a flat mirror, it's a slightly concave mirror. And it bounces the light back to a point out here. And all you do is put your head there with an eyepiece and you can see what you're looking at. Except for one problem. What is it? Your head's in the way. Right? Well, since Isaac Newton, pretty clever guy, by the way. Isaac Newton invented this. He said, you know, we've got a problem here. One way to solve it is to put this diagonal in the way of the incoming light to bounce it off to the side, and then you can put the eyepiece on the side and look in. And the great advantage of that is that you don't have your freaking head in the way, right? Very straightforward. So, but this has another wonderful advantage. Sidebar here, these are much less expensive to make than these are. There's another problem. Until the end of the 19th century, these things were made and they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if any of you have been out to the Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin, there was a problem with that. When you turn this huge telescope up, anybody want to guess what happened? That's a lot of glass. It's heavy. What's it going to do? Sag. Exactly. And when it sags, what happens to the shape of the lenses? Yeah, we got a problem. So they reach their limit. Now with a mirror, yeah, you can make that thing as big as you want. It's supported from behind. It's bouncing light. Well, that's where everything went, so we ended up with telescopes like that. Now, anybody want to guess the third kind of telescope? Combine the two. Yep. Otherwise known as a compound. There are a bunch of different ones. They're Schmidt Cassegrains, Schmidt Newtonians, um, but they all do the roughly the same thing. There will be what's called a corrector plate or a Schmidt corrector out front. It's kind of it's like a lens, but what it does is it prepares the angle of the of the light coming in. It gets a little complicated. I'm not going to get into it tonight, but it bounces off a concave mirror just like this does has bounces off to the, to a little mirror that's actually convex at the front which adjusts the, the path of the light right down through this donut hole and at the back, and then again the diagonal if you want it. Okay, yes? Does it get a blind spot? Uh, nope. Be in fact, the, the in both of these cases, you don't get a blind spot because the, the really critical aspect of the light is around the perimeter. 
here. Um, and the light you do lose, you get a blind spot in the sense that some light is lost in the middle, but you don't get a black hole there or something. Yeah. Okay, now, pay attention to this little puppy down here, okay? Back to our Kepler, and the light is going to, I think this is the right, God, did I do the right one? Yes, I did it, okay. Um, the light comes in, goes through the Schmidt corrector, bounces off the concave mirror, and instead, of, do you see the diagonal mirror anywhere here? No. Okay, do you see the eyepiece holder anywhere? No. no. Well, why would that be? First of all, there are no eyes up there, right? Okay, so we don't need that. Instead, this is the business then. This is where all the light comes to, and that's where the detector is. And that's what we're going to talk about next. The detector is very important. That's what it looks like. Now let me walk you through what you're seeing here. In the last eh, 30, 40 years, but really the last 20, 25 years for amateur astronomers and professional astronomers, um, one of the most wonderful creations in industrial uh, invention has been what's called the CCD. It's a charged couple device. Who here has a cell phone? Who here, let me do it this way, who here does not have a cell phone? Oh, good for you. I'm impressed. I, you know, it, I'm, I'm serious. It, about every third or fourth day, I reflect on how can I live without my cell phone, really? And then I realize, well, I've got clients, I've got contractors. Uh, no, eh. Oh, well, but I do think about it. Well, in your cell phone, oh, mine's over here, you have a little camera. And believe it or not, inside that little camera is a little chip. It's a small thing. It's a wee, just a wee thing, but they're getting higher quality. And inside that chip, which is about the quarter, a quarter of the size of a, of a postage stamp, there are thousands and thousands of little things that are called pixels. They're picture, picture elements. Uh, does everybody know what a rain gauge is? It's a little glass tube. It has a very specific dimension. And you stick it outside, which is where it works better than it's, if it's inside. Stick it outside. It rains. And f you, you, you uncover it, say, at noon and then cover it again at noon the next day, pull it inside, measure it, and report to the Weather Bureau how much rain there was. Well, imagine these rain gauges, instead of being round, are square. Now put another one next to it, and another one next to it, and another one, until you get just a whole array of thousands of these things. And you covered, say, some, just the landscape with them. You could actually measure if it m rained more about a mile that way than this way, right? Okay. And even rain gauges as they work now are basically that. They're all over the place, but they're not next to each other. Well, these are next to each other. And these are these little pixels. You can't see them with your eye. They're very, very small. And what happens, instead of ga gathering rain, they gather photons or little packets of energy, of electromagnetic energy. And those photons come into those little pixels and they strike them with certain volume, and that impact results in electrical charge of a very specific amount. Now, here's the one other thing to know about CCDs. They each have a specific address, like your house has an address. And whenever they're struck, then all this information goes running down a little to a collector, and it goes into your laptop, and then it's restructured on the screen based on the address. So if you're the first pixel, you're 1A or something, then 2A two, and so on. And the result is you see an image like you're seeing right now. Well, that's, that's what these little blue things are. Those are arrays of billions of little pixels, gazillions of them. And that's what's at the business end of the telescope. When all that light bouncer bounces around, it ends up smashing into those little guys, and you get your image. Look familiar? Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of you, that is, that crucifix form is a representation of what you saw in the previous image. 
And this is where it was looking. Remember the black cat blinking, kind of not blinking and looking, licking its chops? Well, that's where it was looking, metaphorically. But this is where it really was looking for four years from, I think, oh, I want to say 2008, uh, 8, 9 to 12 in there. And now it's, it's, it's on a, what's called the K2 mission, which is it's looking at different parts of the sky for many months at a time, about two or three months at a time. But the same kind of idea. Um, ultimately, no, I can't say with confidence because I haven't really looked into that. But from hearsay, it was a balanced location that was close enough to the plane of the Milky Way that there would be a high enough population to work with, uh, but not so close that it would be overwhelming. So it was kind of a Goldilocks zone. And there were other places, other candidates, but um, that's where they were. Now here's the one <laughs> little interesting bit. The subject we're gonna, one of the subjects we're gonna mention tonight happens to be located literally on the line right here. If the researchers had inhaled when they assigned this location, we would have missed this object. I mean, it's right there, right there. Um, okay, where are we? Trend in modern technology. Now, what, what it's doing is this. Oh, yeah, there it is. There, the, the red dot, if you can see it. I know, it's very important, right? Um, okay. What's going on is <coughs> that Kepler, the black cat, was looking at a bunch of stars and just waiting for them to simply dim. And now we're not talking about twinkle, twinkle, little star stuff. The reason we see stars twinkle, as probably most of you know, has nothing to do with the inherent nature of those stars, but rather our own atmosphere. It's like looking at a dime at the bottom of a swimming pool. Kind of the same principle, except instead of water, we're dealing with our atmosphere turbulence. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about genuine dimming. And what's one way to dim something? Put something else in front of it. Put something else in front of it. Look, I've got a good group here. <laughs> my, and my, I'm asking my students to be good because I know you know the answers to some of these very, very complex questions. But anyway, so, um, so here's the thing. If, if a planet is orbiting a star at this kind of an angle, and we're looking from here, are we going to see it transit in front of the star? No, no. so that's not gonna work, right? Uh, how about here? Is that, gonna, is that gonna be better? No, no, because it doesn't go in front of it, right? But, as you can deduce by now, if it does that, we're good, right? Oh good, I, I like this audience. <laughs> Interactive. Then we can see it. And it needs to be in a fairly narrow range as long as it's within the disk of the, of the star, even though the star, as I'll explain in a second, is a pinpoint. It's, it's known as a uh, point source. You can't really see a disk. But, for, but locally, if the planet is at, s if its orbital plane is some small angle either side of alignment, we get to see something. Makes sense, right? Okay. Now, if we were going to count the little dot patterns on this entire floor, how would we propose to do it? Would we all get down on all fours and for days and days count all these little smudges, dots? Probably not. You sample it, right? You take a square inch or a square foot, you, you agree on some representative square area, you might spend an hour or two counting there, but, but that's a lot better than days. So you count that, come up with a number, and you do mul multiplication, right? And you're done. What percentage of stars do you think have planets that are exactly aligned with us in this manner? Not many, would you say, right? Maybe, maybe a percent, half a percent, but pretty small, right? Okay. Keep that in mind. This is that array field of view. I'm sorry if I'm walking in front of them. Let me work on my 
methodology here, but um, these are three known exoplanets that were orbiting, transiting these stars in that field before the black cat went up and started to look, Kepler. And in the, f in the f I think it was the first year, <coughs> this is how many saw. Remember what I said about instrumentation helping us see more? There you go. All right. <coughs> and um, this was the first thousand, approximately. Notice that last word. This is very important. Candidates. Okay. No, I'm not going to get into politics. Um, candidates. Because they're... Remember when I asked a little while ago, what's one way of causing a star to dim? It's putting something in front of it. Well, that's one of a number of ways to get a star to change its brightness. There are a number of other ways, uh, a whole bunch of them. Gas and dust get in the way. Um, very big star spots, like sunspots, but some of them get very, very big and they can diminish the brightness significantly. Uh, what else? Inherent internal chemistry. There are some stars that are very unstable. They get bright, they get dim. And then there's a, another type, which I would love to get into, but we're not gonna get into tonight. And those are binary stars. Now, Interestingly enough, only about 40 to 45 percent of all the stars in the universe, based on our surveys, are single stars like our sun. All the rest of them are double or multiple star systems, that there are two or three, and I think there are as many as five stars orbiting each other. And this is all the roll of the dice of how the original gas cloud from which they formed coagulates, you know, kind of accretes into a mush of masses. But these are called candidates because they all showed a pattern of dimming. It doesn't mean there's a planet going around them, but it's a starting point. Okay. Um, after a while, so after some confirmations using observations from people like me, so from what are called sometimes called technical amateurs or uh, uh, um, there can be a s a side institutional observation programs like by small colleges using their smaller observatories to confirm some of these. You need lots and lots of input. And once you get a whole bunch of what are called light curves, and we'll get into that in a second, once you get a bunch of light curves, then you're in a position to start characterizing how big these, I mean, the, the, where the candidates do turn out to be planets, how big the planets are, what their orbital period is, and so on. And this is what came up after, by uh, 1912, 1912. Now, notice the blue dots. Those are, those are kids like us. Not one or two or three, quite a few. It is privately estimated that our galaxy may have a couple of trillion, that's T with a, that's T, a couple of trillion almost exact Earth planets. It's gonna be a very interesting future, presuming we make it past the next 50, 100 years, who knows what's gonna happen, but anyway, they're, they're, once we get to know how to move out through space, it's going to be a very interesting time. Okay, so let's, um, let's do a little bit more background here, and then we'll, we'll continue into the real fun stuff. When you look at a star field, there are a couple of, or when you look at it, sorry, an, Im an image of a star field, you're looking at two lies, okay, or alt facts, if you want. Um, two alt facts. One old fact is, you see these little spikes? Those, those aren't really on, on any star. Those are caused by what's called a spider. It's a sp the spider is the bracket that holds the secondary mirror. Remember, 
I think you brought up over there, the, the question of something obscuring the field of view. It doesn't obscure it, but it affects it by virtue of the bracket that holds that secondary mirror in place. Light, as light comes into the telescope, it kind of wraps around those brackets and, and accumulates along those axes. And for aesthetic reasons, it looks kind of cool, so sometimes it's lined up like that. So that's, that's a lightweight boo-boo. The other thing is if you look closely, if you come right up here, what you see is a disk, a round dot, right? When reality, you don't see that. A star is a point source. And in fact, it's, it's these stars, even though they're humongo, are so far away that they're way inside the limits, the acuity, li the acuity limits of your eyes. And even the acuity limits of telescopes. It has to do with something called the Dawes limit and other things like that. But you can't see them. It's, if they didn't shine, it wasn't, wouldn't be an object you could put a flashlight on and you could see it. It'd be too far away. So they're called, they're called po uh, point sources. Why, that's, why is that important? Well, it's important because we cannot see these planets going around these stars. All we see is the star dimming. And this is, this, here's, this is a, 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 a mushy example. Now, this is a disk, which it shouldn't be. Imagine that's a point, all right? But limits of PowerPoint. Um, speaking of which, oh, yeah, let's do that. Let's see if you're, we have a professional button pusher here. Yeah, go ahead, go. Now watch carefully. It gets dim, and it gets bright again. That's all that the black cat saw. That's all that Kepler saw. It saw a point source get dim, and it saw it come back from being dim. That's it. From your backyard, if you have a reasonable telescope, it doesn't have to be a five billion dollar installation. You can, you can experience this. You can do variable star work, get your, brace yourself for those of you who are interested, without a binocular, without a telescope, with your own eyes. And as it turns out, human beings, and this is a whole nother talk I give, human beings are very, very good at discerning brightness differences between a star that's not changing and one that's changing and estimating using a numerical system how bright the one is. We're pretty good at this. That's an aside. Um, okay, oh, I'm, I'm my old habits, yeah, go ahead. Okay, now, this is what's going on if we got close, if we managed to get close to the star, this is what we would see. Go ahead, killer. And we would measure it as a light curve on a graph down below as the planet goes across the face of the star. Very st conceptually straightforward, right? Okay, next. And I don't know if that's automatic or not. Give it a second. Yeah, go with it. It's going to be a lot easier to see a big planet going around a small star than a, hit it again, <laughs> than, a s than a small planet going in front of a big star. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. This is, these are what you could call the low-hanging fruit. These are the, they're called super Jupiters or hot Jupiters. The, for reasons that are still under study, these big Jupiters, instead of being way out where our Jupiter is, they're in like where Mercury is or even half or one-third the distance out from their star that Mercury is. I mean, they're right, ne they're right there. And so they have orbital periods, not of 12 years, which is what Jupiter has, but of... 14 hours, 18 days, you know? So guess what? Talk about low-hanging fruit. You can get a so-so telescope and record this kind of thing. But as you can imagine, the smaller the little guy is and the bigger the star is, harder and harder. To give you a sense of, of uh, example, next please. Um, this is real stuff. This is our sun. Uh, you are here. There's the profile of Jupiter. Jupiter uses up only about 1% of the area of the sun. And at 55 Cancri, it's a, it's a star, so as you can see, somewhat larger than our sun. 
It has an Earth-like planet, a, a super-Earth as they're called, like two to three times the size of Earth, orbiting it, and we've detected it. But you can see in comparison what we're talking about here. The biggest super-Jupiters might kick up to maybe one and a half, two percent of the area of their sun. Remember, stars are big, right? And even big planets are still planets, right? Next. And this is what a, st uh, a, a light curve looks like. Um, you have brightness on the left. The, bright the higher you go up the y-axis, the brighter. And then time left to right. And then this thing's going to move over in a second. And then each of these little dots, these little s they're actually little squares, are the data points. That's where the telescope took an image with the CCD. Remember the CCD? Took an image with the CCD, and it recorded the brightness of the star as that. And they wiggle up and down because you've got ASP atmosphere. Maybe the telescope's wiggling a little bit because of wind. All kinds of things, okay? And you get little surges. It's a bit of little surges in the electrical current of the whole system, all kinds of little goofy real life things, but it averages up. Okay, if you can kick it. And as time goes by, this is what happens. And all those little dog bones, that's what they're called, little dog bones, the little dog bones are error um, ranges. And that's just a mathematical um, uh, exercise to determine the likelihood that the, that the measurement is off or how far it could be off from that. And the reason it gets a little wacky over here, it could have been that there's some haze moved in in our atmosphere or a cloud went by, all kinds of things like that can happen. But it still averages out. And what we're seeing here is the brightness of the star being interrupted and then returning to its original brightness. And that interruption, of course, in this case, was caused by the transit of a planet. Now you may be wondering, rightly so, why does this line go here? Why doesn't it just go straight down, over, and up? And that would be a simply superb question. <laughs> but I want you to think about it for a second. What shape is a star, generally? Round. What shape is a planet? Round. So you've got a couple of simple geometries there. And when, and you saw my little planets go in front of my little stars there. When they first touch, the planet is obscuring zero light yet. I mean, when it's first there, just eh. And when it enters in, it's occupying a wee little bit of area, may not even be measurable, like right there. But as it moves in, more and more of the planet is moving in, right? It's not like a flat thing going bang. I mean, if a, if a star was weird universe, who knows, maybe it's out there. W if, a, if a star was square and a planet was square, you might get something like that. But even then, it's going to take time for the square planet to move in front of the star, right? And in that time, the amount of obscuration is going to increase according to a curve or a linear rate or something. It's not going to be immediate, right? Okay. Well, let's go to the next one, dear. Thank you. You're, you're very good at this. Um, and one more time, please. This is called limb darkening. Every star that we know of exhibits it. And as you can imagine, as the planet grows, goes across that profile, this is a bit exaggerated through filters, but it, it's a real phenomenon. The contrast between the planet and the background is going to be much less on the limbs, right? than in the center where it's brighter. Right? Make sense? Um, okay, next. And so you get this kind of thing. These, are, these show the limb darkening. These are real transits of real planets. And they're shown where they are with respect to the equator. They're down, they're di differentiated away for some bit. And you can see the different signatures. Now why is this important? Well, besides it, it's science, and it's always important. but. <laughs> But each of these conditions leaves a distinct signature. If we see that kind of shape, ah, we can deduce from that a different condition than if we see that kind of shape. We can deduce what's going on between that planet and that star. You get the idea? It's like different fingerprints, right? Uh, yeah, next one. 
Um, now this is actually pretty straightforward. It's actually kind of a clever thing. How often do you think a planet's going to cross the disk of the star right at the equator? Not too many times. They just roll dice and it's not going to happen, right? Well, that's what this is. It's kind of a map showing the kind of profile we would see depending on where it cut. That black line, the heavy black line around here is at zero, zero, which is the equator. That's what, that's what the curve would be like and that's the light that it would, that's the light differential that it would obscure. All the way up to, it kind of barely grazes the ear of the pole. So it's up there for like for four minutes, you know, that's it. And depending on those angles, we can determine that just from this information. Okay? Next. All right. Now, this is where all of you come in, if you want to. Remember that word, candidates? Well, there are a lot of stars being discovered as of, what's today? Today is the 28th, right? As of the 24th, four days ago, um, <coughs> there are... 4,500 candidates, 4,500 candidates that have been discovered to date. And th those are the stars now. Those are the star-planet relationships. And as you can imagine, there may be more than one planet going around every star. And so now we have a, about confirmed, confirmed planets, 3,500, some of, many of which are going around the same star. And they have different configurations and so on. Well, how do, we, how do we determine what's what? There's a lot of data out there. You know how many astronomers there are? You could almost fit them all in this room. No, uh, not quite, but a big gymnasium, and you'd get most of the major astronomers in the, in the United States and, el and overseas. Not a lot. Um, how many people are there in the world? Quite a few more, right? How many of those do you think are curious about things like science? Okay, and what happened about 10, 15 years ago, some, some people at NASA and elsewhere in the education program, they said, is there anything wrong with bringing in the people who pay the taxes that pay our income to play, to play in our sandbox with us? said, no, what, let's give it a try. And there were a lot of scientists, and I can remember a dinner party where I had a knockdown, drag out, but very mannered discussion with a scientist who said, this is a bunch of malarkey, the general public doesn't know anything, they don't, he went on. And I said, all we're asking them is to look at that thing and that thing and tell us what the difference is between the two. Well, that's not science. Right, right, no. Unfortunately, he's a good friend of a good friend of mine, so that's the definition of diplomacy. Anyway, so these programs were created, Planet Hunters, Planet Quest, there are a couple of others. From where you're sitting right now to where you would be qualified to analyze this stuff would take about, anybody want to guess how long? In schooling, so whatever. About four minutes. No, I'm not being funny. I'm not being metaphorical. <laughs> I'm not leading up to a punchline. About four minutes. How do they do this? It was very simple. Is you get online, you go to the, you can look these up. To, if you Google planet hunting stuff, something you'll find them. And they give you like a little walkthrough quiz. It's, it lasts about three or four minutes. Some, some a little longer, some less. And you can do these for cancer research, for brain surgery work. I'm not kidding. And what they do is they want, they have a h mountains, mountains of data, and they want people to compare things or look for patterns. Just find wiggles here. If you, see, if you think maybe possibly you see a wiggle there, just mark that image and send it on. What's, by the way, don't be nervous because it's not just you. There are about 100, 500, or 1,000 other people who are going to look at the same image as you, and they're going to say, eh, I don't see nothing. Or they're going to say, oh, man, look at that. And, and then over 200 people, there's going to be an average response. You see where we're going with this? 
And once in a while, if you see something really weird, you can write down a little note and say, I see something really weird. And that red flags these things. Well, that's one way to ver help verify this. And you can learn much more about this. I'm not going to go on about it. Uh, but it's a really, really cool engagement. And you can do as much or as little as you want. You, it's not like you're committed. You have to do four hours a day for the rest of your life, no matter what. No, nothing like that. You can do four minutes, five minutes one day. You can do three hours. It's a rainy day. You're in the mood. You're gonna go, you go through a bunch of them for half a day if you want. It's up to you. You, you, know, you want to skip a couple months? You can do that. Um, well, through that methodology, early on in the Kepler mission, we started to characterize the appearance of these planetary systems. Go ahead. And this is the kind of thing we saw. These are diagrams representing the character of some of these systems. Um, and I think by 2012, we can go to the next one. We had a few more. This is about 2% of them, by the way. It's like putting a, it's like all of you. There are a bunch of people in this room. We all have arms, legs, heads, we have hair. Well, most of us. Um, we have clothing on, most of you are sitting, but I would challenge you to find two people that look exactly alike. If you, uh, uh, in a baseball stadium filled with people, I would challenge that. Oh, you're gonna get people that look, yeah, the hair's almost exactly the same. Well, they're about the same height, yeah, yeah, you can, but every, no. Nature is like this. It's, it's the same, but in a random way. Um, now, you get the idea of what, let's do a quick review. You get the idea of a light curve, right? A th one thingy goes in front of another thingy, blocks the light, and leave, it leaves a mark in the form of that curve, right? Okay. This is where things get interesting. Next. And s many of you have probably heard about this lady and about this object, excuse me, about this object, it's known as Tabby Star. Um, and, they were, and yes, they were having fun with WTF001. And, and what that stands for, of course, is, and uh, there aren't too many, is uh, where's, the fl where's the flux? And flux, flux is the technical astro astrophysics term for rate of radiation, that is, what's leaving that orb, that star, that body. Um, and it tends to be all inclusive of, of the electromagnetic spectrum, blah, 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 blah. That's Tabitha Boyajian, the PI uh, on the project, uh, sorry, the uh, principal investigator on the, on the project. Um, she has a wonderful TED talk, some of you may have seen it, where she summarizes all of this. And she and her team, the way this works is that people like you, and maybe tonight some of you will do this when you get home, um, started looking at these light curves. And their, their, their assignment was to look for dips in that data. Remember the dog bones? Sometimes those things can get kind of messy, and you see maybe a dip, you're not really sure, and you flag it, and so on, just as I mentioned before. Well, what happened is that as I, as I mentioned a little while ago, that you can write, you can type in, say something's weird here, remember that? Well, a lot of people started doing that with this one light curve. I don't know what's going on here, this is strange. It doesn't, it doesn't look like the other light curves. And the kind of undergraduate assistants who are working this looked at it and said, oh, I know what that is, that, uh, wait a minute. That's sort of weird. So they went to the graduate students who were supervising them and said, hey, there's something weird here. And they said, no, oh, come on, I don't have time for this. Besides, I'll be able to explain it. Okay, look. Well, they looked. Yeah, you know what this, this, oh. Well, that's kind of strange. And so they went up to, we see where we're going. They went up to the professor and then the supervisor and blah, blah, blah. And finally, the serious, no-nonsense researchers and said, what's all the hubbub about? And she became the PI, one of the ser serious she doesn't look at there, I know, but, but one of the more serious research efforts to try to find out what this was. Um, and what they, almost, but 
Um, and what they, what they came up with was really, really goofy. Go ahead. This is an image I took uh, from my little mini observatory in the ba on my back deck. Very high tech. Uh, no, <laughs> talk about l a low rent observatory arrangement. But you don't need much to do a lot of work. Anyway, you see these four, little four, four well, let me get it out of the way. L these four little stars, they look like a little chair. Okay, well the second one from the top is Tabby's star. Um, okay, you can hit it again. And this is a blow up of my image and this is the highlight. That's it, it I mean, doesn't look weird, right? It's just a dot, okay? And this is the light curve. It look, look first at the top, that's the main light curve up here. Do you see one of those little curvy things? I don't. Okay. Now, remember how I mentioned Jupiter would use up about one to one and a quarter percent of the light of our sun? Well, this star is about one, between, we think between one and 1 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Not necessarily the size, but it's probably a little larger than our sun. <sighs> Jupiter at one and a quarter percent would show up about, would go down to about there. Something's using 20% of the light of the star. Repeatedly. 20%. There's no planet that we've ever seen in the universe that size. Nothing. It, that's why it's a mystery. <laughs> that would be a very good guess. And the thinking was, ah, you know what it is, the binary system, and the other one's broken up. But we know a tremendous amount of, about binary stars. I mean, even the weird ones, and they wouldn't behave this way. Um, Joe Patterson, who was a great mentor of mine, still at Columbia when I was teaching at uh, Columbia University, the astronomy department there, he's one of the world's top experts on this. And right away, this, th they would look nothing like this. Very, very strange. Now this yellowish area here is, is what you see down here highlighted. These are all the same, this one, this one, this one. It's just the vertical exaggeration is greater in each one to, to highlight the details of the curves. All right, so that, you get the sense of scale. Remember this is about four years, so 500 days, 20 days, so what, what two, four, six, about 80 days across there is worth of data. Remember, this, this was all observed after it was, after it was observed, if you will, because the telescope was gathering this information, piling it up in a back room, so to speak, in a digital back room, and it had to wait until people got a chance to look at it. We have a whole lot of data like this that no one's seen before. And some of you can't, I'm, I don't know, I'm sound like, sounding like I'm recruiting, that's my, not my intent, but you can be the first human being who's ever seen data about a star, and it happens all the time. That's one of the fun parts of astronomy. Anyway, well, here... Excuse me, but have we ever seen binary planets? Binary... I mean, we have planets with moons orbiting them. Yeah. Have any, has anybody ever conjectured about binary planets? Um, not, you know, spheres that would be almost equal in size that orbit each other? That orbit each other? Yeah. That's a, it's a very interesting question. I don't know of any such phenomenon that's been found. If it ever would be found, it would be found under these kinds of surveys. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Were Pluto a planet, that would be true because it and its close neighbor... I think it's oh, Charon, Charon, yeah. That they, their center of mass is between, is between them. them. That's, a, that's a very good point. That's, that's an example. Um, there are some other reasons that Charon is technically a moon of Pluto, but that's a good example of how close it can get. And if it can get close, there probably are examples like that. Now, there's no physics, uh, I, I know of no physics reason why that couldn't be. Uh, it would, you would get into aspects about how um, protostellar disks are formed in the early, early stages of a star. And those protostellar disks, as, as I'm about to note, get extremely violent. It's a very, very messy time. You know, like newborns, what do they do? They throw up, they poop, they don't, they make a mess when they eat, they cry. I mean, they're a mess, right? It's a wonder we even mess with them, right? 
Well, that's what stars do also. I mean, when, when stars form, oh, you've got clouds everywhere. You have huge chunks of boulder stuff crashing into other huge chunks of boulder stuff. You have leftover planet body parts. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy, okay? That's in the early stages. And little by little, like corporate America, the bigger ones start gathering more stuff, and the bigger ones get bigger and bigger and bigger. They become molten, and they turn into planets, given a couple more million, hundred million years. Um, and in those dynamics, would it be possible for two orbs to form in the same proximity? It's very unlikely, but I don't think it's zero. The dynamics could be goofy in some way, but I'm speculating. Interesting question. Um, next one, yeah. Actually, you know what? Go back. If you, I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I just pushed that little backwards thing. Um, a couple of things I want to point out here. We'll see how we're doing. Yeah, we're okay. Oh, yeah, we've got two hours left. Okay. Um, yeah. You're la laughing? Okay. <laughs> There's some interesting things going on here. Obviously, we s like the symmetry here. Why that symmetry? Why not? I mean, it's a, a broken symmetry, a different kind of broken symmetry. But you see a break up there. Also, we see two patterns that are kind of similar. An initial dip and then a major dip. A, li a little dip and then an initial dip and then a major dip. There's something going on here that seems a little, little repetitive. Is that sheer coincidence? Don't know. There you go. Next. Uh, and th that's just a close-up. Um, no, I'm going to skip that. Go ahead, keep going. This was the um, this was the tabby, the tabby uh, team conjecture educated conjecture. Comets. That's, that was their word for, instead of saying aliens, comets. A whole lot of them. Comets leave huge tails. And if there was some disturbance, for example, um, just about every star we suspect has what's referred to, a, a, in our case, as the Oort cloud, O-O-R-T, the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud stretches about halfway to the next star in radius and it's composed of literally hundreds of billions of comets separated by millions of miles. So it's pretty empty out there. Remember, space is big. However much stuff is somewhere, space is bigger. But if a star comes nearby within a, maybe a couple light years, within a light year and a half or something, it won't crash into them, but the, the gravitational influence of the passing star can stir things up. And those comets could come down, not in onesies and twosies, but in whole swaths. And that was one thought. So they came up with this notion where thousands of these would come in. It didn't explain a lot of those patterns. Those patterns are solid things, right? They're not fuzzy wuzzy tails. And then somebody and I dropped a bowling ball in the punch bowl. It was another researcher who said, oh, okay, that sounds interesting, you know. I was curious. So he went home, pulled out an, an old envelope, literally back of an envelope, started scribbling some arithmetic, which astronomers are known to do. Turns out it's a very, very plausible hypothesis if you allow for not thousands, but trillions of comets, trillions of comets. And then the mathemat mathematical possibilities of that kind of event made it not a zero possibility, but pretty ridiculous. Even, even the tabby people said, yeah, okay, yeah. So back to square one. I have no idea what it is. Okay, next. Ah, uh, you know what it is. We're just being dumb about this. What's really going on is that there's this big cloud of debris around. A lot of stars have this, especially young stars. Okay, this isn't a young star. Um, it'd be like a 22-year-old that you have to feed, is throwing up, is pooping. So you don't see too much of that, at least we hope. You know, It's kind of creepy. Um, 
But maybe something's going on where they're, I don't know, leftover junk. Well, that's possible. That's possible. Okay, next. The only thing is, well, let me do a little background here. You've all heard of the electromagnetic spectrum, at least heard about it, even if you're not familiar with the, inti the intimate details of the thing. With the, a quick 20-second, well, maybe a little longer, summation. All energy is the same stuff. It's on the same spectrum, okay? And it's separated by wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the more muy macho the energy, the stronger the energy, the more powerful. Longer the wavelength, the more mellow. Think hippie, okay? Gamma rays, think CEO, all right? Pathological, all right? Does a lot of damage, <laughs> all right? Out here you have hippie land, man. It's like, it's all cool, it's all right. And in between you get kind of the rationalists. That's where our, that's where we, our eyeballs work, is in the visual, the optical range. For example, if I would take a hippie or some, you know, a radio wave and I would infuse it with some energy, I could turn it into infrared energy. If I put in a little bit more energy into it, I could turn it into optical light, which is what we see with our eyes. And I put more energy into it, I can work my way down through x-rays and gamma rays. Now whenever a supernova occurs, a lot of the nasty stuff really gets going and it travels throughout the universe. Part of the reason you look the way you do is because of supernovae that occurred billions of years ago in galaxies far, far away. Because once in a while a gamma ray makes it through and it affected the DNA of your great, 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 or your mom or your dad. And that adjusted a little something in you. As we speak, the occasional gamma rays coming through this room, none of you know it, or I, and your DNA is being a little affected. Technically, it's being damaged, but then it repairs itself and it changes. So the more energy you put into the electromagnetic particle, the, the, the more robust it is, if you will, and back. Well, concentrate here on infrared. When stuff bangs into itself, what does it do? Yeah, rub your hands together if you have doubts. <coughs> I mean, you can do it now if you want, or some other time when you get home and privacy of your own home, you can rub your hands together. Um, and, and they'll get warm. Well, that's what rocks do and dust and gas and dust when they're <coughs> banging into each other. And in that, that protostellar disk, there's a lot of that going on. And when it does, it radiates copiously at this wavelength, infrared. That's a sure sign of a lot of junk going on around one of these things. Next, please. To give you a, an example of what this looks like, Somebody mentioned that these, the cousins of these guys run across the roads maybe about this time of year. What is it called? The big, the big, big night. Thank you. Um, I didn't know that before I put the slide in, this image in. But this gives you an idea of how this stuff works. Next. And this is a real, live, honest to goodness, infrared image of a protostellar system not too far from us. Well, it's far enough away, but, and we're seeing it face on, the stars in the center, as you can imagine. And the dark areas are where protoplanets are vacuum, th vacuum cleaning, if you will, th using gravity, the gas and dust that's in that disk. And wherever else the dust and gas is, it's glowing, and especially close to the star, for two reasons. One, it's the closer it gets to the star, well, the more violent that, re that relationship is. But number two, what's near all this stuff around here? 
the star. What is a star? It's pretty hot. And it's radiating onto that stuff. Very often this junk around here can be quite molten. It gets hot. So there's no doubt. And one of the greatest signatures of early star formation is this kind of infrared signature. Next. Um, and just as a sidebar, this is a, an inner planet in that system. It's an inner planet in about the same orbital distance as we are to the sun, really cleaning out the interior area. Hard at work, okay? Now, there's one, there's one little problem. Remember, let's go back to Tabby's star and that whole notion of all this debris around there and all that junk. So what's the first thing you're going to want to do? You're going to want to aim a telescope up there, put an infrared sensor on it, and measure the infrared. And of course, it'll you know a huge amount of infrared is going to be coming out of there because of all that debris, right? And that's what we did. Not I, but researchers did. And sure enough, what did they see? Almost zero infrared. Yeah, well put. That's what they said. <laughs> well put. <laughs> but that's when the suspicions about Aliens. came forth. Thank you. <laughs> because how could you have all this stuff around a star and not have it glowing in infrared? Well, maybe because it's not banging into itself. It's a construction. All right, so, so the pro-aliens just whoop boom off they went. And they had this guy's help next. Some of you, I'm sure, know, th know of this fellow, Freeman Dyson. Real crazy guy, brilliant. Uh, uh, not the same, in fact, no, not the same guy. <laughs> That's a different Dyson. Um, he, his mentor was um, uh, one of the um, Manhattan Project guys. Oh, uh, thank you. Feynman, wonderful guy. Anyway, those two guys were, became drinking buddies. They had a great time. Um, but pretty brilliant. Came up with all these ideas. And one of his ideas was known as, next, the Dyson Sphere. The whole notion was that su super, uber, duper future uh, civilizations are going to want to capture a lot of energy for all of their future stuff that they do. And one way to get a lot of energy is to enclose a star and collect 100% of the energy that star creates. So it would take maybe millennia, if not more, to build this thing. <laughs> but if you did, it would have all kinds of sort of semi-symmetric light curves that it would generate. It's a construction-y thing. Next, please. It's another image of one of these. Um, I've, I have a little problem with this. Now, this is, this is moi. Um, not, not just the notion of it being implausible on the surface of it. If there, was, if there was compelling evidence, trust me, I and certainly many of my fellow astronomers would be up all night trying to verify. Not because they didn't want it to be, but because if it was, oh, does it, how, name one thing that's more cool than being the first person or being on the first team to verify the existence of other creatures in the universe. I mean, it does it get better than that? I mean, are you kidding? Researchers would love it, but, be, but they know they would love it, and so they slam on the brakes, and they're very careful. Here's the kind of socio-technological problem I have with this notion. It's very parochial technology. Think about it. If uber, super duper advanced, let's just take human beings and what we've done with technology so far and just do a linear ex extrapolation of the future. <coughs> what, what do we do with electronics? Smaller and smaller and smaller. What are we trying to do with energy? More and more efficient. We're not going bigger and bigger on energy. We're going bigger and bigger in energy because we have a, a population explosion and a product explosion. But there are economies that suggest that that will table out in time. 
This is an extremely, extremely inefficient way of interacting with energy. This is, in my view, this would be the equivalent of very, very intelligent people 150, 200 years ago trying to determine how big a wagon wheel and how you'd have to design a wagon wheel that would be sufficient to get you, get your cart to the moon. In other words, we're, we're extrapolating our own technological biases here. That's my problem. It's not, it's not anything in the data, but there it is. But there is some compelling stuff in that data that is very creepy. Next. All right, so I'm going to come down to earth very kind of quickly. I'm, yeah, we've got a little bit of time, but I think we're going to wrap this up within the hour, half an hour, something like that. Um, we're going to go through this quickly because I want to get to the next thing, which is not as long by far, uh, but it's interesting. Um, stars spin. Some stars spin really, really fast. And when they do, they become oblate. When they become oblate, they have a time. This, uh, this is well known science, by the way. There's no doubt about this. When they become oblate, they have a tendency to display a much hotter surface at the poles than at the equator. Think about it. When, if the equator is going out, it's spreading out. There isn't the compression, there isn't the density, there isn't the temperature and pressure, right? It's, it's going to be more to the center. So you get lighter and darker. Well, what's the net result? Well, put a little, send a little planet across this. It's next. And all of a sudden, that, cur that symmetrical curve, ooh, it's wiggled over to the side a little bit. You see how that works? It's biased. Next one. Mm. Yeah. On the other hand, mino sino central spike. So where's that coming from? Next. Um, skip that. Yeah, next, because it's a little redundant. Yep, there we go. Okay. Next. And then you start matching these up, and you st notice I said you start seeing some similarities. Some similarities. They're not identical. Um, there's an old saying in science that, that great discoveries are not made by the, are, are not announced by the exclamation, Eureka, but rather, hmm, that's funny. Um, there, there's, a, there's a story, and I can't, I, I, I'm almost not going to, well, okay, I'll say it, because, so, because the point will be made, but I don't remember who, when, turn, turn of the last century, and a lab technician, an assistant, was assigned to clean out a bunch of Petri dishes. This, uh, this had to do with uh, looking for diseases and so on. And was cleaning these things out. They were done with them. And he found one in which there was no growth. Most of us, I probably would, would just rinse it out and go on. And he said, you know, that's kind of weird. I'm going to leave that for the morning for the researchers to look at. And that was the beginning of the solution to, I, th I don't know, polio or measles or something. It was something big that resulted in a bunch of us still being in this room. So that's, that's good science, is noticing that things weren't quite what they were supposed to be. Instead of being 97.3, it was 94. Well, why wasn't it 97.3? You know, just random problems or something. Let's track that down. Most scientists say, hey, we got as close as we did. Let's be happy. Let's go have a beer, right? Well, this is kind of in that category. This is, okay, I'll give you a little bit. It's not really there, though. It's not really there. And this one, yeah, yeah uh, that might explain this, but what's going on here? And so on and so on. This is the nature of science. We tend to get 90% there all the time. And, and it's that 10% that keeps us going back to the lab or the observatory or whatever. Okay, next, please. And finally, on this object, this is a very, very interesting thing. 
when this whole stir came up about Tabby Starr, of course, a lot of undergrads and grads were assigned to go back in the archives. When at Columbia, we had this, my f it was my favorite room in the department. It had all these glass plates and these, um, these prints and negatives, originals, taken at the Palomar Observatory going all the way back to the last century. And these stunning, beautiful, and they were reversed so that it was black stars on a white background because that's easier to see when you're doing technical, technical-ish stuff. Well, they found that Tabby Star in some of these old photographs, and they were adjusted appropriately, blah, blah, blah. It's been dimming all this time. Linear way. Well, what kind of thing might do that? What if you had a construction project that was covering the star over time? Aliens, right? The alien people just jumped on this and said, that's it, that's it, that's, that's not evidence, that's proof. No. By the way, the word proof is almost never used in science because it's, it's, it's a philosophical absolute. We're done, we'll never have to look at that thing again, that's a given, there's, a, there's no such thing in nature. Now my favorite little thing I've got to tell you, this is my, little, my own little joke. I think from here to here, they may, have, they may have suffered a, a, a labor strike. <laughs> they negotiated and got back to work, and here we go. Wouldn't that be funny? We, get, we meet these aliens. Hey, you have labor strikes too? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I think we've got one more on this, yeah. Tabby Star isn't the only one like this. We're finding more and more and more as, guess what, with our new instrumentation, our new telescopes, we're looking deeper into space with higher fidelity. We're finding more and more creepy, strange stuff. None of these are explicable. None of them are explicable. Are they all, I mean, are they all? Or none? Um, we tend to assign that word to the gap in knowledge, but it could be even more interesting. Well, that'd be tough, Trip, fair enough. But it could be almost as interesting in that we may be finding some new kind of phenomenon. Okay, upward and onward. That's the end of that one. That was a long one. Now we're going to do the short one. These are called, of all things, FRBs. And the reason they're called this is that they don't last very long. They're in the radio range. Remember the hippie range of the electromagnetic spectrum, and they're very high energy. So they have the rather exotic name of fast radio bursts. Easy to remember. Next. Um, these things are, well, they're kind of tough to capture. Um, it's like suspecting you have a mouse in the kitchen, but you never see it. All right. Oh, no, it's there. We yeah, it's, oh, yeah. We, well, that's what happened here. By sheer accident, some telescopes in the last 20 years happened to have been pointing that away and another one that away. And these things, like that, they, they last milliseconds. That's right, thousands of a second some even microseconds, micro, mil, mil, very short periods. They have a bit of an echo, but what usually happens in astronomy, if you see a weird thing, you call up Joey and Suzanne at the other two observatories in other countries and say, hey, listen, go to these coordinates, tell me what you see. Um, if we ever got a SETI si suspect signal, this happened on occasion, the first thing, th the last thing they do is keep it a secret. <laughs> first of all, as human beings, that's the last thing we're going to do. But it's, it's, not, it's not the protocol. W w w you want it to be confirmed. So you get another radio telescope to point at the same place and say, what do you see? You say, I don't see anything. Okay, then you got a problem. Um, problem is, how do you call up Joey at the other telescope and have them point at the same spot in the sky when it takes <coughs> their telescope, first of all, it takes maybe a few minutes anyway, if not half an hour, to shut down for whatever research they're doing at that moment and move it over 
to the coordinates and then bring up the signal, make sure the signal's clean and so on. Milliseconds? I don't think it's going to happen. So these things are really quite elusive. But when they come, they come with the energy uh, by extrapolating back. I mean, they're, they're pretty strong here, but they're still pretty weak. But we can determine how far away they are. There are no methods to do that. Well, I'm not going to chew up time on that. But it turns out that they have, that they come out with the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of times the energy output, output of our sun in, say, a month or a year. It's a lot of energy. Um, well, you're going to love this. You know what one of the explanations for this is? Aliens. And guess from whom? George Bush. <laughs> no. Better. Wait, there's more. Better. Harvard. <laughs> Serious. They just last week accepted a paper saying that we're not saying this is what it is, but one of the things it could be because of the nature of the radio signal so on is that it's a pulse used to propel uh, interstellar sails from one star to another. Well, the same problem I have with the last one, I have with this. What's one of the biggest items in the news now? It's this 20 year, 20 year flight to Alpha Centauri project. Um, they hope to have it get underway by the 2020s or late 2020s. Uh, it's a very real thing that some of the technologies have not been invented yet, but that was the case with Apollo. Guess what? Yes, we did really go to the moon. If you don't believe that, see me after class. Um, anyway, so that's, that's, what, that's where this thing is coming from. Way far back. Next. Uh, is there a very good question. As of, I think it was just announced a couple days ago, this stuff is happening fast. If, th if I had given this lecture in January, as, w as we were planned to do, it would have been a different lecture. We have new information coming in. We just found one that repeated, which is very curious. Um, that smudge is even less discernible than the previous smudge. But they were able to determine what this was. Next, drum roll. Um, that's not it, but that's identical to what it is. Um, it's an elliptical galaxy. Elliptical galaxies are old. I mean, they're, they're not quite using walkers, but they're, they're getting there. Um, and they're, they, there isn't a lot of star formation going on. In fact, almost none. Uh, typically, you get a couple of spiral galaxies, like the Milky Way, uh, to collide. And we're about to do that. Um, I, I, might, I hope I don't distract you tonight, but um, we're, the Milky Way galaxy is about to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. And this is it's right around the corner. It's going to start in about four or five billion years. <laughs> and when the whole ballet is done, we're going to look something like that. Uh, the Earth won't be around by then anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <coughs> let me give you a sense of how far away this fast radio burst is. Next, please. Have any of you been here? Okay, you're the, the Grand Canyon. Um, if you sat there, magically, you could sit there and watch the Grand Canyon take form about 120 times. That's how long it's taken the light from one of these fast radio bursts to get to us moving at the speed of 24 Earths per second. That's 186,000 miles per second, the speed of light. If you took 24 Earths and lined them up like a string of beads, that's the distance that a particle of electromagnetic radiation moves in one second. And at moving at that speed for about 120 of these, it finally arrived at our sensors. It's kind of far away. So I'm very amused when I see in some of these journalistic re reviews about how, you know, maybe we should be worried about whether or not they're, they're evil aliens. <laughs> yeah. Build a wall. Build a wall. <laughs> yeah. Did they ever train the, the, the SETI uh, equipment for the, the 
things? That's a superb question. The answer is yes. Um, the SETI array, the Allen array out in California was turned to Tabby Star, and I think it's still monitoring it. And they've been receiving a, a, a nothing. So, zip, nothing. Uh, now, Tabby Star isn't quite as far away as this. It's fift about 15 light years away. 15, about 1,500 light years away. 1,500 light years away. That reminds me, there's, there was a great, great little lecture. There was a great lecture back in the 50s. I think uh, Hans Bethe was speaking, great, very well-known physicist. And he was giving a talk about how long the sun is going to last, and it's going to be five billion years before it dies and all that stuff. End of the lecture. And very nice lady, way in the back, raises her hand. Excuse me, professor. Did you say five million or five billion years? And he said, oh, I said five billion years. And she said, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Yeah, so you've got to put these things into perspective, you know. Uh, so next, I think we're going to wrap this up. There. So causes, next. I was going to say something. Uber transmitter, that, as I, I meant that. I, I, th that's re actually a possibility. I'll explain why mo momentarily next. Now to the boring stuff. This is what happens to a star. This is probably going to be the shortest summation I have ever given of this. Gas squishes together, accretes together. It's all hydrogen. The hydrogen in the center of the star where it's much denser, much hotter, and hot enough to fuse the hydrogen, which is one nucleus and an electron, and another, then you get another hydrogen atom, which is a nucleus and an electron, and they merge together, which is in other words, they fuse, therefore called fusion of all things, and they become helium. Now, in, that's counterintuitive because as little kids, we had little balloons that went up, but helium is actually heavier than hydrogen. And what does heavier stuff do in a given medium? Sinks to the bottom, right? So it all goes down here. And it gets hotter because it's denser. And eventually, in a really, really big, massive star, it fuses even further and it keeps doing that and creating heavier and heavier and heavier, heavier, heavier stuff all the way down to iron. And every time this fusion occurs, that fusion releases a, a little bit of energy times trillions and trillions and trillions of, of fusion actions. And that's a lot of energy, very hot star, etc. Until you get to iron. And when you get to iron, iron needs energy in order to fuse. Well, all this time you've got this explosive force trying to blow the bejesus out of this thing, right? At the same time, it's a very massive star, so you've got this gravitational force trying to squish the bejesus out of it, and they run into a nice little agreement, sort of like Republicans and Democrats, well, maybe not these days, but and they, they strike an equilibrium, okay? But when the iron stops, stops the process, it grows, and all, the, all these layers grow more and more quickly in a really massive stars. The hydrogen turns into helium over maybe a million years. The next stage is maybe 100,000 years. The next stage maybe 120 years. Blah, 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 blah. You get down to iron, seconds. The iron accumulates in the center, and the, the suddenly it reaches a point where there's so much gravitational pull, it overwhelms the very, very high forces that keeps little atoms apart. The whole thing collapses, rebounds, and look out, supernova. And it leaves a core. Next, please. Supernova. Okay, next. And what's r the result is, more typically, is a neutron star, where the proton, remember the proton, the nucleus, and the electron, by the way, give you a sense of proportion. You take the nucleus of an atom, a proton, and it's about the size of a pea, and you put it right down on the 50-yard line, and this thing just fell off. I'm going to turn it off. I'll hold it. Um, on the 50-yard line, and you put a dust moat that you can't barely see 
on the goal line, that's the proportional relationship between the proton and the electron. That goes to zero. So now you have an electron, which is a negative charge thingy, and a proton, which is a positive charge thingy, and they mush together, and what do you get? Neutral thingy. A neutral thingy. Neutron. And so now you have this ocean of neutrons cheek to jowl. And if you, you've heard this, some of you have heard this before, you take a teaspoon of it, and it weighs a thousand tons. All right? And it's about the size of the tri-state area around New York City. It's not the, a few tens of miles across in some cases, and spinning like hell. Back in the 60s, radio uh, researchers found these things that were sending signals to us really fast, like <laughs> And they didn't know what they were at first, but they had an idea, but just for tongue in cheek, you know how astrophysicists are, the astrophysicists are, you know, they're, they're a stitch, right? Okay. <laughs> and so they decided to call these signals LGM signals. Little green men. <laughs> true. No, that's true. So these LGM, they're still called LGM 2215 something. It's, it's a little tongue in cheek that's going to go on for quite a while. Anyway, and this heavy liquid, in I'm, I'm really, this isn't working well. Uh, the heavy liquid interior is really, liquid is a, sh it's liquid because it's fluid, it moves. But at 100 to 1,000 tons per teaspoon, this is pretty dense stuff. And this thing is spinning. You know, the old the skater pulling in the arms, spinning faster. When that supernova occurs, this thing crunches down and, <laughs> and creates the little green men signals because there are hot spots on the outside of this. And every time one of those hot spots swings around, if it happens to be t facing towards Earth, we get a beep, 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 or, you know. Some of these things are spinning so fast. I mean, you can, you can listen to them. You go on the internet and look, at, look up um, <sighs> pulsar sounds, and you can hear these. Some of them are moving so fast, all you hear is a hum. And they're rotating, in some cases, close to their structural limit and they are probably quite oblate. Next. But the outer, si uh, the outer, co co um, the outer shell of it is quote-unquote normal matter, but extremely squished. So the, the, um, uh, the Mount Everest will be something like two microns high because of the gravitational force. But this, like, you know, you've heard of plate tectonics on Earth, has the same kind of thing, but every time this stuff budges, it releases incredible amounts of energy. So where am I going with this? Well, what happens when we don't have one of these, but we have two of them, we were talking about this before, two bodies together, spinning around each other. Well, there's a lot of junk, every time there's one of these quakes, stuff gets spewed out, so now the environment is a little dirty. And what does that do? That causes drag on those two things spinning around, and it's going to slow them down a wee little bit over millions and millions of years. And what are they going to do? They're going to get closer and closer, right? And one day, next, they fuse. And when they fuse, two things happen. First of all, their total mass effectively doubles in an instant. And when it doubles, the gravitational force collectively overwhelms all of the nuclear forces that are keeping all the little atom pieces apart. And it starts to collapse in on itself. Brace yourself, ready? Forever. And faster and faster. It's known as a black hole. And in that instant, it releases a gargantuan amount of energy in the radio wavelength, amongst others, that would look exactly like what we're seeing in fast radio bursts. That's how science really works. Now, is that what's going on? Hasn't been determined. 
next. That's what we think gamma ray bursts are more locally. Same kind of phenomena, okay. Now, can you tell the difference between a natural assembly of boulders and maybe one that's not so natural? Okay. Now, but I bet it would take a little while before you could run up with some rules about under what circumstances you could separate one from the other. But it's like that, uh, who was that congressman who many years ago said, I don't have a definition for pornography, but I know it when I see it. Well, that's sort of the same thing. We don't, may not have a technical definition, but we know it when we see it. Next, please. Right. Well, before, before we go on with this bit, that we have, th Supreme Court Justice? Thank you. See, that's how much I know about politics. Um, <coughs> that's why I'm not. <laughs> In the radio realm, there's something that is very characteristic of natural phenomena. They look like, radio waves look like those, those rocks just sitting on the ground. It's called, a, it's a wide band pattern. Um, when you listen to FM radio, what you're listening to is what's called a narrow band signal. If we ever receive a narrow band signal from space, trust me, there will be a lot of coffee percolating. Maybe not even coffee because it won't be necessary. Researchers are going to be up night after night checking this thing out. Has that ever happened? Yep. In 1977, I believe, somebody knows the real date and correct me, but I think it's 77. In Ohio, um, there was, there was a, a st it was a static I did that. Uh, a static radio receiver, meaning it was spread out on a field. You can look at everything. Ohio, it's not Ohio Wesleyan, but anyway, oh, no, in northern Ohio. And back in that time, uh, what was received during research efforts were these printouts. Remember the how computers would print out these long sheets that would fold onto each other, and rah, 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 okay, and they had a little number code. So. Uh, a s uh, an intensity of signal will go zero 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 one zero one zero 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 one two four four five six seven eight, and once it got beyond nine, it would go to A B C D. Okay, right as multiples. So you could read this thing and see how intense a given signal once, say, from Jupiter. So, it, because all all celestial objects radiate in the radio in some form, but. But it's like the, the pooping baby. It's just kind of messy. It's, it's not a distinct thing. And there was this one signal, lasted about 70 seconds, and it was a narrow band signal. And this technician came back and was having his cup of coffee, was looking through the sheets. Wow! And what he did is he wrote wow on the side, and to this day it's known as the wow signal. And he called everybody up and said, hey, it's going to there, go look, look. Never been, what to this day, radio, uh, radio um, antennae, when they have a little free time, they go back and look, just in case. They go back and look see, to see if there's a repetition. And it was, it was a relatively, that was the trick, it wasn't exactly a narrow band signal, it was, relative, very, it was pretty narrow band signal. There were no military, I mean, this is 77. It was young in the time of military satellites and all that. So, and, and the military, the, the, company, uh, the companies, the countries of mili that owned military satellites at the time have long since, yeah, we didn't have anything, our stuff as it was over there. Um, there's no other explanation, but it hasn't been explained yet. So, very weird. And it, it's the basis, by the way, for a sci-fi book I've been working on for 10,000 years now. Uh, so things to watch for, uh, go ahead, have fun there, yep. For KIC, this is for Tabby Star, next. Watch in the next few months, they're going to start doing, because remember, uh, or what you may not know, is that uh, Cygnus, the swan, is now on the other side of the sun from us. So we have to kind of wait until the Earth gets around a bit further in its orbit so it can see Cygnus and start 
looking at Tabby Star again. And one of the first high priorities is going to be to look for the infrared, the infrared profile um, in the next few months. That probably was going to occur June, July on sometime. Next. And for the FRBs, what I was just talking about, go ahead. Look in the, watch the news for information about the bandwidth nature of that uh, input. Okay, now we're all, I think we're getting to the end. Go ahead. Okay, now this is the, this is the do it on your own bit, which is very short. I, I think it's like 20 or 30 slides, not more. Uh, no, this is much less. If you, if you want to get into this stuff, I'm going to go through this very quickly because if you have a passion for it, you're probably heading towards it anyway. Next. Um, next. One way to do it right. Learn. Read. Go to a library. Be a pest. Ask for lots of books. For go read through them. Next. Look. This is so important. Get, get a crappy little chair. Go out back. And if it's cold, stay out there for three or four minutes and look up. You don't have to know anything of what you're looking at. Just look. If it's clear, go back in. And then a week later, it's clear again. Go out and look again. Do this three or four times. After a while, you know what's going to happen? You on your very lonesome, you're going to start to recognize patterns. You're going to start to recognize, oh, those two bright stars. I remember seeing those last week. You don't have to know what they are. Just keep doing that. Next. And attend events. Obviously, you're doing that now. Next. Join a group. There are quite a few groups around this area, and I've got some links to them. Uh, the Keen group is very good. The president is here. So I had to say that. No, I, I, I mean it. <laughs> As you guys have a, I still am jealous about your website. Uh, that's our fault. Uh, then there's Sovera, th the group of which I'm president up and out of Chester. Uh, next, and rinse and repeat. <laughs> Just keep doing these things and, and look, if you have an interest in something, whether it's mushroom collection or stamp collecting or bridge, you'll pursue it. Next. So what's the stuff you, if you're going to go out observing, what's n nice to have? A red flashlight. Now, um, I swear to whatever stack of physics books that this happened. This, uh, th it actually has happened twice, but the one I remember quite well was back at Columbia, I asked my students that the next time we do the lab, we're going to be up on the roof, we're going to do some observi observing, even though Manhattan is like a, an arc lamp. So bring, bring, a, bring a red light because we'll be in the dark inside the observatory, blah, blah. So bring a red flashlight. And one of the students brought a red <laughs> flashlight. <laughs> Poor thing, she almost cried. I could tell. I said, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's, you know, I should have been clear. <laughs> um, but you wa and what you can do, by the way, there's a very easy way to do this also, is you a regular flashlight and put a couple of layers of brown shopping bag paper over it and just put a rubber band. That's good enough to hold you until you decide to go out and buy these $280 super duper things. Oh, they're out there. I mean, they look like aircraft carriers, you know. Next. Something to write things down on. It's amazing how valuable your little notes about you. The first time you looked at so-and-so planet, and when you read this 21 years later, it's precious. I, s I, have, I have these ring notebooks filled going all the way back with Jeepers. It goes back, some of them go back to the 70s, I think. They're wonderful. I don't know what the hell I see here, but it's really cool. You know, that'd be strange stuff. Next, the most important part of observing is being comfortable. And it's not just like a, a fun, snarky thing to say. It really is, because if you're comfortable, you're not going to be distracted by the cold or anything else. You're going to be paying attention to what you're doing. A cheap little chair like that is fine. Better if you can just leave it out in the backyard. Is getting one of those lawn chairs that leans back so you're looking up like that. Because with these, you're sitting kind of upright and you kind of have to look back. But they're very light and they, they, they're indestructible. They're seven bucks each or something like that. So if it breaks, big deal. Next. Um, if you know nothing about the sky, you certainly, I mean, almost everyone since a kid knows about the Big Dipper. 
And you, some of you may know about Cassiopeia, but you may not know that they're always opposite each other on either side of Polaris. These are the finder stars to find Polaris. So find the Big Dipper here. Now, this is, there's something called circumpolar stars, and these are stars that go, uh, go appear to be going around the pole. It's, of course, it's the Earth that's rotating, but they never set, but they can get very low down in the trees, so it becomes impractical to look for them. But one of these two puppies right here are always up in the sky. So if the, as you can see, if the Big Dipper is down in the trees here, where's Cassiopeia going to be? Beating, right? And the opposite. Go ahead. So you start with that. You start with that, and it's a little bit like when you were a kid and you were learning the map of the United States in what, second grade or something. I learned all about that in kindergarten. I wasn't special. <laughs> no, anyway, I'm joking. But, but you know what I'm saying. You, what do you do? You look for the Great Lakes. You see Florida down there. You see California. And then you go for New York, Chicago, maybe Los Angeles. And then eventually you get down to Peoria, right? Okay, same kind of thing with the sky. You get to know the big dumb stuff first, and then you branch out from those. The other thing to do is consider a planetarium program. Now, a few, a few of these are under two or three thousand dollars, so they're very affordable. <laughs> no, they're almost. You can get online and look up planetarium programs, best planetarium programs uh, on Google and then most of them are free. This one's free. This is uh, Stellarium. Um, I don't use it that much. I, I, I have a paid thingy, which gets pretty involved because of the work I do, but um, called Starry Night Pro. And it's, I love it. It's really good. But, but it's a few hundred bucks, and a lot of people are not going to want to spend that kind of money. You don't need to. Get a free one of these things and just dabble with them. There's a learning curve in it, but this one now is... <laughs> About five, six years ago, this was a little, in my view, it was a little klutzy. It has become wonderful now. This is just one, but there are a lot of others. So I'm not, it's not that I'm pushing this at all, but there are quite a few of these. One interesting thing in the culture of astronomy, people who are in it are really generous. They, they just love sharing astronomy. And some of these, I mean, this stuff is made by undergrads <laughs> in their spare time. And they like just disseminating it and thinking it's cool. All these people are using the software I came up with. So that becomes a kind of normal thing. Um, next. I think, yeah, join a group. And when you join a group, and a lot of people, and I'm going to dissuade you from this, and this, I think we're, we're yeah, I think we're just about done here. Um, there's a, there's a tendency, tendency to have this image that, okay, if I join this group, I mean, they're going to have all these PhDs, and they're, I'm going to feel so weird. You know, I'm so dumb. I don't know anything about anything. Nothing could be further from the truth. Two things. Two things. One is that, as I mentioned, in this culture, there's a tendency, there's a tendency to be extremely open and generous and wanting to bring people in. Number two is that, especially at star parties, people love to have you look through their telescopes. You know, they're, they're not at all weird about, oh, listen, I'm doing something special, uh, just you know, come back later or something. You never hear that kind of thing. Never. Um, next. I think it pops in. There are a couple more of these. Um, there's a site called astronomyvermont.org, and it's a listing of all the astronomy groups in the state. This was put together by um, Jonathan Kemp, who's a dear friend of mine, he runs the observatory at Middlebury College, and he and his wife, again, dear friends, ran the world's biggest telescopes at Mauna Kea for 10 years. Uh, they know what they're talking about. Anyway, he put this little website together that shows you where all, how you can link to all these other groups. Um, and I th uh, oh yeah, one more. And that's, that's it. These are the, this is Sovera's connection that's keen astronomy and astronomy vermont any questions you're good all right thank you very much thank you